Coming in at number 5 we've got Asmodeus. A lot of folks take great issue with some of those classic vices. You know the ones. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. All plenty of fun, all the bane of puritans and teetotalers across the globe. If you delve too deeply into any of the above, you could find yourself receiving plenty of disapproving looks. Too bad, considering how much folks tend to enjoy these things. Is it possible to have too much of a good thing? Hard to say, especially these days. Who knows when the good won't be available anymore. However, traditionally folks have looked down upon those consumed by lust, whether it be carnal, money focused or otherwise. Thankfully you can blame a demon for all those urges. Isn't life funny that way? Who made up morality anyways? Why not just explain it all away by saying it's totally out of your control? Beautiful, it makes up for everything. So we've got Asmodeus, the supposed son of Adam, once an angel of harlotry. Of course, his angelic properties aren't really around anymore as he fell from heaven and now lives as a demon in the underworld. With time, he became more well known for stuff like gambling and lust, and somehow became Lilith's husband, which is fun. The two of them, both labeled temptresses, produced all sorts of demonic babies to keep the fire of hell hot. There's also the famous story of Asmodeus killing seven husbands in a row to keep one woman from consummating her marriage. Like every time she got married, Asmodeus would show up and murk her husband before they could do the deed. But then she'd go out and get married again. At some point you think she'd learn and see a pattern and stop feeding her suitors to a demon, but hey, maybe she liked the demonic attention. Asmodeus is pretty wicked looking too. Rocking three hideous heads, this demon gets around by riding a dragon. This isn't his only look though, as he can appear as a few other forms to appeal to different types of people. I mentioned gambling before, and anyone with that kind of habit can thank Asmodeus for it. Gotta love it. Lastly, his powers do tend to get stronger in November, so once Halloween wraps up, be on the lookout. Lust might not stick around as easily once everyone puts away their sexy costumes, but hey. Coming at number 4 we've got Abyssithibu. Rocking with another fallen angel here, we've got Abyssithibu. A little tougher to say and spell, but just as scary and powerful. Raunchy as all hell too. See, Abyssithibu left heaven at the same time as the devil himself and didn't take the fall that well. He used to be a flatterer of God, but once he took that trip to the down below, things got ugly. If you're familiar with the most legendary gaming villain of all time, you'll see some inspiration here. While falling, Abyssithibu was used as a life raft of sorts by other fallen angels. They grabbed at his body and managed to take hold of one of his wings. This led to the feathered appendage being torn off, leaving our poor demon to be with only one wing. Eventually it did sort of grow back, but not as it was. Mm -mm. Abyssithibu is known for having a red, grotesque wing. That's how many recognize this demon. Badass, but probably really upsetting to deal with after many lifetimes of perfect angelic wings. Like I said, once he made it to hell, things went extra south. He rules over Tartarus, which is essentially hell jail. All of the worst of the worst reside here, suffering eternal torment in a cage of their own creation. How lovely. Abyssithibu also has quite the command of sorcery, able to cast powerful spells and persuade influential figures to act in unholy ways. For these reasons and more, it was decided that this demon could no longer have sway over humanity. Abyssithibu was eventually trapped in a pillar of air, meant to be trapped for eternity. Tough break for sure. However, many do believe that Abyssithibu will return one day and bring with him thousands of years of fury after being trapped so long. His red wing will unfurl and he will return to his vengeful and cruel ways. Who's excited? Coming in at number 3 we've got Legion. One person can be many things, but in this case one demon is actually many demons. And these demons were so nasty, so evil, that Jesus himself had to exorcise them. Holy smokes, right? Legion is quite popular in the pop culture pantheon, and many famous exorcisms and related events seem to use him as the prime example. With so many demons dwelling within one main demonic form, they can take over the souls of people relatively easily and with varied results. However, all of the demons that make up Legion act as a sort of hive mind. They all have the same knowledge, thoughts, and reactions to things, and if one demon from the collective experiences something, they're all aware of it. With all of that knowledge and the ability to spread out all over the place, Legion can be a terrifying adversary. And even though Jesus does manage to send Legion back to hell in the Bible, there isn't much guaranteeing that many parts of Legion can't come back. Most folks only experience Legion as individual parts too. This is when the demon is at its weakest, as each individual piece of the whole only holds so much power. Were Legion to assemble all of the many together, we could be in trouble. Imagine all the limbs. Coming in at number 2 we've got Vetus. 
Ah, corruption. Such a classic human form of folly. We work so hard to avoid it and even do our best to prop up those who remain pure of heart and purpose, but corruption spreads pretty much no matter what. We can thank Vetus for that. Second in command to Lucifer himself, this is the demon who wants to tempt holy people away from their chosen path. Even the most pious has a chance of being drawn in by this demon. He works very hard at figuring out people's deepest desires and then encouraging them to revert everything they believe in to achieve said goals. Oftentimes these desires are less than socially acceptable and at worst they can be quite taboo. Does Vetus care that he's ruining lives? Probably not. He takes on different forms to be extra convincing and makes sure to really sweeten the deal whenever he can. However, there is a way you can tell if Vetus is trying to tempt you. He only speaks in rhyme. Interesting, right? Hold on, there's a form of communication that almost exclusively communicates in rhyme and tells people to act in all sorts of wild and depraved ways. Music. Pop music specifically, but hey. Do you think that Vetus is communicating with modern folks through the tunes we so often hear on the radio, telling us to consume, to cavort, to consummate? That's insidious. And finally at number one, we've got Beelzebub. Speaking of music, how many songs explicitly reference Beelzebub? I can think of two right now, Bohemian Rhapsody and Beelzeboss. I'm sure there are plenty more, but you can drop those in the comments. As you do that, I'll continue on my way talking about this demon. Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies, the devil, but also maybe not the devil. There's so much to say about this particular demon and so little time in which to do it. I'll see what I can do with what we've got today. So the Lord of the Flies may be associated with literature read in schools these days, but back before we had a tale of British boys losing their minds on an island, that association with insects was filthy. Ruling over flies meant you had domain over demonic excrement and rot. Not a good thing, right? Throughout history, people have blamed Beelzebub for all sorts of things. He was closely associated with the Salem witch trials and cited often when folks were put to death. Plus, years after that was called off, he was again referenced in many exorcisms, both infamous and unknown. All of this pales in comparison to his actual standing in hell though, where he is known as the Prince of Demons, and rules over the other basement dwellers with an iron fist. His ultimate goal is to destroy the world and it seems as though he's been planning this for ages. Tricking people into worshipping false idols, commanding other infernal beings, and sowing seeds of discontent, nobody's doing it quite like Beelzebub. I'd recommend learning a song, wicked enough to defeat the devil, otherwise you're probably ending up going down to hell with him. Number 5. The Plagues of Egypt So coming up first is going to be the Plagues of Egypt, a classic, horrifying biblical story for Bible fans of all ages. While the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, Egypt, the good lord was trying to show the ruling pharaoh at the time that he'd better let all of the chosen people go or there'd be some serious trouble. Now the pharaoh didn't heed the warning and was divinely punished ten times, one for each of the pharaoh's false gods. Now maybe you've heard through cultural osmosis that there was a reign of frogs and locusts, but unless you've spent some time in between the pages of the bible, do you know all the other horrific plagues? Because there was ten of them, a lot of horror going on. Let's go through them in order. First up, we had the Nile River running red with gold resulting in dead fish and undrinkable water. Plague number two, the frogs. You know what a frog is, I don't need to explain that, they're like these little green guys. Then came the lice, next plague, then the flies, kind of similar to the lice really. And then the big livestock plague, this one was kind of fun. It killed off large swaths of farm animals, chickens, cows, others, dead. Then we had everybody's favorite plague, the boils. Painful, disgusting red sores and boils manifesting on the Egyptian skin. Mmm, scrumptious. Now the boils were cooled by the next plague, which was a scourge of hail that destroyed the crops and lands that gave life. And then the locusts came. Everybody loved the locusts. They're like little bugs that eat everything. Next plague was a thick, never-ending cloud of darkness, which was probably fantastic for vampires and real dour for anybody else. Now if you've been keeping track at home, that's nine plagues, meaning we got one last plague and that's the death of all firstborns which afflicted every family in Egypt. Finally a win for the middle children of the world. The good lord asked all the Israelites to paint a bit of goat fluid on the door to make sure the angel of death knew they were chill and not to pox any firstborn children. The plagues of Egypt, it's kind of a story that showcases that when you make God angry, he takes that really, really personal. I think that's literally what they mean when people are talking about divine retribution. It's stuff 
stuff like this. It's plagues of locusts and frogs. And if you're looking for way more scary videos that might be about Insidious, might be about the Bible, we've got all of that and then some on the channel. Seriously, we got, if you can think it up, we got two or three videos on it. So click on through, hit subscribe, please ring that little bell as well so you don't miss a single one of our videos as soon as they go up. But do that at the end of this video because I got four more stories loosely related to Insidious coming up for you right now. Number four, the Witch of Endor. Now coming up next is the story of the Witch of Endor. It's not the Witch King of Angmar, the Lord of the Nazgul. And this isn't involving the forest moon of Endor where the shield generator for the second Death Star was built. It also doesn't have a lot to do with Insidious. We've crossed all three of those worries off. I'll tell you what the Witch of Endor was. Now the first king of Israel, Saul, who was a notable good man, was facing a severe crisis. He had disobeyed God and was facing an impending war from the Philistines. So in desperation, Saul sought out guidance from God, but was left on divine red by the big man upstairs and was being ignored. His pleas were unanswered. Saul did what any of us would do in a similar situation when you can't get aligned to God. In trouble? Better call the Witch of Endor. Oh, did you think I was gonna do like a better call? Never mind. Saul rang up the Witch of Endor, a necromancer of some renown who was able to help Saul conjure the spirit of the dead prophet Samuel, hoping to gain a little insight for the upcoming war against the Philistines. Samuel's spirit appeared and spoke to Saul. Samuel's message was a very grim one, letting Saul know that he was not gonna do terribly well in this war and was gonna lose the war and also die. The prophet reiterated that Saul's disobedience and rejection of God had led to this outcome, you know? Mind your manners, mind your P's and Q's, maybe you won't die in a war. Overwhelmed by the encounter, Saul fell to the ground in despair. Bear. The witch then provided him with a meal before he departed. Now the story of the witch of Endor serves as a cautionary tale against seeking supernatural guidance outside of God. I think that's a pretty easy moral to follow. Don't contact a necromancer. Be careful with your spiritual mediums. Uh, Josh Lambert in the first Insidious film got lucky when he contacted a trustworthy medium and I don't remember the name of that character, but you might not be. So Josh Lambert, King Saul, pretty similar. Number three, the Book of Enoch. Coming up next today is going to be the stories out of the Book of Enoch, an ancient religious text that is attributed to the biblical figure Enoch. Duh. It's the Book of Enoch. I would assume that he wrote the book. Enoch is said to have been allowed to take a little tour of heaven and shown divine visions of the afterlife and the kingdom of God. Now there's a lot of discrepancy from Christian scholars if this book is considered a canonical text, but it is considered very significant and is unsettling. It does have some interesting mythological aspects to it dig into. The most well-known portion of this book that people discuss, people talk about, is referred to as the Book of Watchers. This section describes the descent of angels known as the Watchers. Doesn't that sound ominous? Now these angels became obsessed with human women and their beauty. And I mean, come on, can you blame them? Have you seen human women? Va va voom. Anyway, these angels settled with human women and they birthed a new race of beings called the Nephilim. Now the Nephilim are described as being these gigantic, monstrous, hybrid human beings. Kind of like, this is a nerdy reference, but if you've ever seen Attack on Titan, those big things, they're kind of like that. Listen to this quote about how they were corrupting humanity. And they became pregnant and they bare great giants whose height was 3,000 meters, who consumed all the acquisitions of men. And when men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned against them and devoured mankind. And they began to sin against birds and beasts and reptiles and fish and to devour one another's flesh and drink the blood. Enoch was chosen by God to deliver a message of judgment and warning to these fallen angels and their scary giant offspring. He was shown a glimpse of judgment day in the establishment of a righteous kingdom on earth. A bright vision of a future where the insidious franchise is talked about with the same reverence as the Godfather trilogy. Theaters are filling up. People are pre-ordering tickets. They're getting IMAX releases, Blu-rays with special features. There's an extended Insidious universe. It's bigger than The Conjuring. It's crossing over with The Conjuring. Not all of that was in the Book of Enoch, but some of it was. Number two is going to be the story of Job. This next story is my personal favorite story from the Bible. I've always found it kind of fascinating, even as an outsider. It's the tragic story of Job. Job is a righteous, God-loving man who lives in the land of Uz. Not like goo, Uz. Satan, Lucifer, the devil, Beelzebub, Pete Davidson, whatever you want to call him, the devil appears before the Lord one day and proposes a friendly challenge. The devil challenges God and says that Job only reveres the Lord because of the blessing and protection that he enjoys. And that if Job had a terrible life, he wouldn't worship God. So God kind of does one of these and thinks, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. So God grants Satan permission to test Job's faith. Seems like a horrible thing to do to one of your subjects, but hey. So Satan rubs his little paws together and gets right to work tormenting 
parenting job, Job loses his wealth, Job loses his family, and Job loses his health. However, Job loves the good Lord and his faith does not compromise. So Job's good buddies, you know, his close friends, Elphiaz, Bildad, and Zophar, you know how everybody's got a friend named Zophar, come to comfort Job. But they tell Job that all these things are happening to him because he deserves it. Uh, suffering is a punishment for wrongdoing. Job is like, hey, I didn't do anything wrong. He maintains his innocence and questions why, as a righteous man, he must endure such immense pain. So he presents this case directly to God. He rings him up and to try and understand these reasonings behind his suffering, why are you doing all this to me? Job remains steadfast that he's innocent and doesn't deserve any of this. So God responds to Job out of a whirlwind. God speaks to Job, emphasizing his divine power, wisdom, and sovereignty over all this creation. God asks Job a series of rhetorical questions to illustrate how little we as humans really know. And Job realizes this and humbles himself before God, puts himself back in his place. In the end, God kind of undoes a lot of that torment. He gives Job his fortune, his family, and he blesses them with more than he had before. Job's faith is vindicated, and he comes to understand that God's ways are just above and beyond his little Joby human comprehension, and he'll never understand what the big guy's doing up there, but he should just sit back and have it happen. It is presented as a very uplifting, optimistic story about having a like never-faltering faith, but there's something about a story where the divine creator lets an innocent soul suffer immensely just to prove a point that seems kind of terrifying. It, it makes humans seem like ants, you know? <laughs> it's very similar to how the family in the Insidious franchise keeps being tormented, but hey, their faith never falters, and they're always keeping their chins up because the Insidious movies are viable, so they're gonna keep making sequels, and you should see the Insidious, the red door that's coming out in theaters already after this video. They didn't pay us for this. <laughs> Number one, the Book of Revelations. The Book of Revelations, also known as the Apocalypse of John, is the final book of the New Testament in the Bible. So there will be some spoilers if you haven't gotten around to reading it yet. So skip ahead to the end of the video if you don't want it ruined. It's a highly symbolic and apocalyptic text that presents a series of spooky visions and prophecies about the end times and the ultimate victory of God over evil. So our book begins with John identifying himself and stating that he received these visions while in exile on the islands of Patmos. He then addresses seven letters to churches all over the world, offering praise and admonition and encouragement. But the big chunk of the book, you know, the meat of it, what we're all talking about, is these dramatic visions that John sees, these crazy, literally out of this world, these cosmic battles between angels and demons, these heavenly scenes, these things that look like they could be sweet metal album art or like backgrounds from a Doom game, all these crazy battles with the horsemen of the apocalypse, dragons, the lamb of God, oh, big stuff, big really cool stuff that would look awesome painted on the side of a van. The book describes a great tribulation that will come upon on the earth, the apocalypse, marked by natural disasters, plagues, persecution of believers, uh, the rise of a beast, commonly interpreted as a symbol of a tyrannical ruler or empire, and a false prophet who deceives people with miracles and leads them astray. Sounds kind of fun. John sees the ultimate victory of God, though, through all of this. He witnesses the final judgment where the wicked are condemned and the righteous are rewarded, and a new earth is described where God dwells with his people and all suffering and all sorrow are eliminated in this new New heaven and in this new heaven there's as many insidious movies as you want there to be there's endless stories for the Lambert family and that demon that's got like red lipstick on his face and he kind of looks like Darth Maul and I what else happens in the insidious franchise I've only seen the first one but you better see insidious 5 the red door because it just came out and the Bible was scarier than it in at number five Nadab and Abihu burned alive Nadab and Abihu were brothers chosen to serve the Lord as priests due to, due to their family having a rich pedigree their intensive preparation and dedication to serving God. However, when they chose to make an offering to the Lord, they did not know it would be their last. They dressed in their best robes and made their way to the altar to make an offering of incense. It was a known fact that they were forbidden to make unauthorized offerings to the Lord and it is unknown why they ignored this warning. Once their offering was made, a flame engulfed the altar and the brothers onlookers watched as they were burned alive. It is said that these deaths were to show the people that there are no sins too small. The the brother should have known that the incense was an unauthorized gift. Something to keep in mind next time you light some incense in your home. Which I never do, so I'm fine. No one's burning me alive, mother 
Then we end at number four, John the Baptist is beheaded. Now this one starts with some Kardashian style family drama. John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod the Tetrarch for commenting that it was not right that Herod had divorced his wife Vassilus, so that he may take his brother's wife Herodias instead. John commented that it is not lawful for you to have her, which seems like a nice way of putting it. Herod has John imprisoned and was planning on keeping him there. The people saw John as a prophet and Herod didn't want to cause any upset. For his birthday he had a gathering where Herodias' daughters danced for all of the guests. This pleased him and his guests so much he made an oath to grant her anything she wanted. Prompted by her mother she asked bring me John the Baptist's head on a platter. Herod was disturbed by this but he had to keep his oath. That evening John the Baptist was beheaded in his cell. His head then brought on a platter to be presented to Herodias and her daughter in front of all of their guests. It is unclear what happened to the head after this but that is some crazy revenge for gossiping about the family. That's why you should never gossip. Someone might cut out your tongue. In at number three, we have King Herod eaten alive. Here is another example of someone upsetting God and paying the ultimate price. King Herod, a different Herod from the last story, was giving a speech to his people as he usually does. On this day, however, while he was speaking, someone cried out, The voice of God and not of a mortal. He did not repute the claim that he was a god, and it is said that he was instantly struck down by an angel. Angels are savage. We've learned this on this channel. They're evil. The story goes on that he did not have a quick death. He was in agonizing pain for at least seven days. It's like it took God seven days to build the world. Wow. Seven's a good number. Like David Beckham. He was number seven. Not that I believe in God, you know. I don't believe in anything. During this time, it is said he was being eaten alive by worms from the inside out. The worms consumed him after seven days, and this was his slow, painful cause of death. Imagine a worm consuming you. Worms are evil because you can cut them in half, and then they are two worms. That's f you just created two different things. Two worms. When two become one, when one becomes two. Like, what the f? That's, that shouldn't be right. Like you can't, you should never be able to cut something in half and then it becomes two living things. Anyway, that's f and it's worse than the country. <laughs> in at number two, we have concubine of a Levite. This story is about a Levite who was traveling with his concubine, a second class wife. Sucks. Imagine being the second class wife. I only want to be first class. Along his travels, he finds an elderly man who offers to give them shelter for the night in the town of Gibeah. It is a dangerous place no one should be traveling through. Some dangerous men show up at the house looking to have a good time. The Levite and old man decide to offer up the concubine to appease the men, hoping this will keep them safe from the men. The concubine is taken away by the men for the rest of the night. In the morning, the Levite finds the concubine dead outside of where he had been staying. The man is angry for what they've done to her, so he decides to get revenge on the men, so he dies them up. He then sends those pieces to 12 tribes surrounding Gibeah which leads them to attack the city. Dicing your girlfriend up to get revenge on her murderers doesn't seem like the best idea but then again he did offer her up to them in the first place. So you're in the wrong. You should be in the conjuring and I'll possess you. And finally in at number one we have Ezekiel's army of the dead. This next one might remind you more of the walking dead than a bible story. Ezekiel was brought by God to a valley that was full of bones. He walked back and forth among the bones until God asked him if these bones could once again live. God then told him to repeat a prophecy to the bones as he told him it. The bones started to move from around him. They began to form and find the other pieces of the body they had lost. Tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them but they were not breathing, they were not alive. He then told him the final words to speak and the dead began to wake up and breathe once more. God told him that these are the people of Israel who had been killed. He was bringing them back to take their rightful place back in their land. Ezekiel then had a full undead army to take back their land which they had lost. Starting with number 5 we have Behemoth. No 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 not the ride of Canada's wonderland. I'm talking about the mythological beast that dates back to the beginning of mankind and whose name is now an adjective for any large or powerful being. The name Behemoth originated historically from the archaic Jewish name for hippopotamus and is described as a beast from the biblical book of Job. He is a form of the primeval chaos monster created by God at the beginning of creation being paired up with the other chaos monster Leviathan. And according to later Jewish tradition, both would become food for the righteous at the end time. Hey, uh, if I wind up qualifying as righteous, can I have a funnel cake instead? Once again, not any kind of reference to the theme park. 
These beings came first, but now I'm kinda in the mood to tackle a roller coaster. While I've established that Behemoth was a brutish beast known for incredible strength, legend says he was originally created to help stabilize the world, and is known to create chaos in humans' lives, just like my roommate. He is said to take the form of a colossally large elephant, with pitch black eyes covered in white scales that appear to be falling off, and has teeth the size of Mount Everest. Uh, yeah, that's a little too big for my liking. The direct quote from the Book of Job that I mentioned earlier is as follows. 15 behold Behemoth, which I made as I made you, he eats grass like an ox. 16 behold his strength in his loins, and his power in the muscles of his belly. 17 he makes his tail stiff like a cedar, the sinews of his thighs are it together. 18. His bones are tubes of bronze, his limbs like bars of iron. 19. He is the first of the works of God. Let him who made him bring near his sword. 20. For the mountains yield food for him where all the wild beasts play. 21. Under the lotus plants he lies, in the shelter of the reeds and in the marsh. 22. For his shade, the lotus trees cover him, the willows of the brook surround him. 23. Behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. He is confident through Jordan rushes against his mouth. 24. Can one take him by his eyes? or pierce his nose with a snare. Behemoth and Leviathan make an appearance in Revelation 13, as they try to fight against God and can be only slain by God, Thessalonians 2.8, Revelation 19, 19, 20, both these beasts are extremely strong, unruly, and untamable in nature. In Revelation 13, 11, 12, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns, like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. 12. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose fatal wound was healed. And that's enough Bible babble for right now. In fourth place, we have Vine, an earl and king of hell. This earl commands a simple 36 legions of demons. Because I know y'all are gonna make me do the math for this one, a legion is anywhere from 3,000 to 6,000 demons. So roughly between 108 to 216,000 demons. Where's my gold star for calculating that? And how are there so many demons? The significance of his name seems to be from the Latin word venea, vine, which is also the name given to an ancient war machine made of wood and covered with leather and branches, used to overthrow walls. In terms of his appearance, once summoned, he will show up resembling a lion and holding a viper in his hands. Now, I don't do well with snakes. So if you request him to change said appearance, he will present in human form, with long black hair, black wings, and now holding a golden cane. I know there's people out there who might be attracted to this, present company included, but don't take that as encouragement to summon him. Known as one of the most difficult demons to summon and work with, he is also one of the only demons who can identify witches and warlocks without being previously informed about their abilities, along with having the ability to tell the past and future, which I can see is kind of tempting. Vine is insensitive to humanity and cares little for harming those who summon him, making him wildly unpredictable and dangerous to summon, along with having the power to take souls without requiring permission. I repeat, dangerous. Right in the middle of the pack, in third place, we have Pazuzu. If your first response was to say bless you, we have the same sense of humor. You may be familiar with references made to him in The Exorcist and the House of Ashes video game, but we're not talking about Linda Blair's acting today. As an apotropaic entity, he was considered both a destructive and dangerous wind, but also a repellent to other demons, one who might safeguard the home from their influence if he was in the right mood. Remember, if he was in the right mood, kind of like me sometimes. He is quoted as introducing himself by stating, I am Pazuzu, son of Anubu, king of the evil Lilu demons. I was enraged in violent motion against the strong mountains and ascended them. Lilu demons are the class to which Pazuzu and his leagues of demons belong. There is also a notable connection to the earlier Babylonian personifications of the four winds. These beings, as depicted on several cylinder seals, have wings and each represents a different direction of the north, south, east, and west winds. It's important to note that Noted professor of ancient studies, Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals. Franz Wigerman calls attention to the crooked positioning of the masculine west wind in seals, which is similar to the posture in Pazuzu's physical depiction. More connections appear in later seals, as this same bent over figure takes on talons and a scorpion's tail. The main difference in their depictions is the head, and the conclusion was made that it is Pazuzu's body and not his head that denotes him as a wind demon. Another scholar, Scott Neweagle, asserts that Pazuzu's possession of four wings 
means links to the term kipatu, meaning circle, loop, circumference, and totality, suggesting his control over all cardinal directions of wind was inherited from his predecessors. Pazuzu was often depicted with a man's body, the head of a lion or a dog, talons for feet, two pairs of wings, a scorpion's tail, and a serpentine phallus. Around now, you might be thinking, Pazuzu is a long name. He has to have some sort of a, you know, nickname or other moniker, right? Sure. He's been called the agony of mankind, suffering of mankind, or disease of mankind. Take your pick. This god of wind and plague is known as Lucifer's right hand man and has the power to control and rule over other evil spirits, being known to bring forth droughts and famine. It is said that he conspired with Lucifer to overthrow God and they were thrown out of heaven together. He is fond of corrupting the innocent and good, being known to offer help that appears good and benevolent, but actually requires recipients to request more of his assistance, sending them further and further into his debt sentencing them to an afterlife of eternal agony. See, reality is agony enough, so I'll pass. Our runner-up for today is Sergat, first mentioned in history in 1517, whose deceptive and cunning mind make him one of the most tricky demons you could possibly think of summoning. Due to his name, he is associated closely with Saturdays. Sure, he might be the least known demon on this list, lacking the background detail that emphasizes the other demons, but he is still very much to be feared. He is known as the one who can open all locks, which may seem a little silly on the surface level, but once summoned, he is impossible to escape or to conceal yourself from unless it's on his terms. Targets of Sergat are relentlessly pursued until found, and then presented with imagery until they go mad. He was the last demon to be summoned by known demon hunter and documentarist Pope Honorarius in his grimoire. Honorarius had thoroughly documented the strengths and weaknesses of every demon he summoned during his research into the oncoming War Against Demons, but had only written ability to open locks about Zergat before his untimely death, leaving history to believe Zergat was responsible for this event. Now, I'm not going to spell out how to summon him, because I hope I've made it clear enough by now that I exist to discourage that kind of behavior, but I did find it kind of neat that one would need a nail from an old coffin to do so. Oh, and before I forget, Zergat is invisible when he manifests, making him easy to lose track of. And in first place, we have Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies, Lord of Dung, and God of Filth himself. He is described visually as a small and hunched over creature with red or purple skin, ram horns, a forked tongue, and a long tail along with incredibly powerful wings. Kind of sounds like a D&D character. He often prefers to appear as a fly when summoned, which may sound innocent until you consult history. Flies were believed to have been born from rotting flesh and uh, plagues. According to Christian beliefs, he began his career as a false god, convincing men to worship him and trick them so he could give faulty advice that would harm instead of helping those in need. Before in the comments asks for a Bible citation, since I haven't been including them for all of the listings today, I'll mention it now. In Mark 3.22, the scribes accused Jesus Christ of driving out demons by the power of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. The name also appears in the expanded version in Matthew 12.24, 27, and Luke 11, 15, 18, 19, as well as in Matthew 10, 25. Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, every kingdom divided against itself will be ruined, and every city or household divided against itself will not stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then can his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your people drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Funny. Hanging around this spooky stuff has me quoting the Bible more than I ever thought I would in my lifetime. Guess I should have paid more attention to my middle school religion classes or when I was altar serving as a kid instead of just figuring out the perfect angle to tip a candle at to splash wax on my arm. What? I never said I was a normal kid. Beelzebub is commonly described as placed high in hell's hierarchy. According to the stories of the 16th century occultist Johann Weyer, Beelzebub led a successful revolt against the devil, is the chief lieutenant officer of Lucifer, the emperor of hell, and presides over the order of the fly. And I thought I was a workaholic. The 17th century exorcist Sebastien Michaelis, in his admirable history, placed Beelzebub among the three most prominent fallen angels, the other two being Lucifer and Leviathan. John Milton, in his epic poem, Paradise Lost, published in 1667, identified the unholy trinity of Beelzebub, Lucifer, and Aseroth, with Beelzebub as the second ranking of the many fallen angels, a quote from him claiming Satan except none higher sat. In simple English, only second place is Satan here. His specialty is in tormenting mankind, causing wars, instigating murders, and known for his ability to place humans under the spell of other demons upon request. One thing historians haven't been able to settle on is which major sin he represents, with some claiming pride, others gluttony, 
but also some claim idolatry. Personally, since he allegedly originated from being a false god, I'm going to side with idolatry, but let me know in the comments which one you believe. In at five, Aquil. Now there is very little known about Aquil, but what we know is that he is the demon who presides over Sundays and exists within Christian mythology. His purpose is to destroy and degrade the practice of keeping the Sabbath holy, which might not sound absolutely terrible, but if this dude possesses the wrong person, it could be bad news bears for all of us. Imagine the president, a prime minister, even one senator possessed and suddenly we have to work 7 days a week without a single day off. Yeah. Okay, it's a stretch, but there's a reason he is at our number 5. Honestly, no one wants to work long weekends. Just saying. Also, apologies in advance if I pronounce all these names wrong. I'm not a demon. Shh. In at 4, Sergat. Now, Sergat is a minor demon referenced in the grimoire of Pope Honorius, but this does not diminish the fact that he is straight up evil. He's listed as, I quote, Sergat who opens all locks, and his opposite is actually our previous number, Aquil. So before we even get into this demon, we should discuss how many demons are actually mentioned in the great grimoire of Honorius. Who was he? Historians aren't even sure, but they do think that he was Honorius III, who was the Pope from 1216 to 1227. Now no one is quite sure if he wrote the book or not, but he is famous among popes for deliberately conducting ceremonies to summon demons so he could banish the demons back down to hell. A little odd. This dude does not mess around. Now how does Sergat come into play. Well, as previously mentioned, he makes appearances in the Grimoire of Honorius, and he is incredibly deceptive and cunning, making him one of the most terrifying demons throughout history. And in the Bible. Yeah, he's there too. Now, as quoted before, this dude is known as the one who opens all locks, which essentially means he is capable of understanding and opening any and all locks in the entire world, making it almost impossible to escape him or conceal yourself from him. When someone becomes Sergat's target, he relentlessly pursues them no matter how hard they they try to escape, and once he reaches his victims, he frightens them by presenting them with images that result in them going mad. Yikes, don't summon this bad boy. In at 3, Agarus. Agarus is a demon described in demonological grimoires as a duke. Under the power of the east, an old man riding upon a crocodile and carrying a hawk on his fist. Agarus is known to teach languages, however he also stops and retrieves runaways, causes earthquakes and grants noble titles. Now I shouldn't technically be saying he, because Agarus can be a man or a woman. If the demon is a man, the man is old and riding said crocodile. If the demon is a woman, she is young and angelically beautiful. Now it's surprising how many demons are teachers. They instruct those they visit or possess and grant knowledge and power, so I guess it's not all bad. The exorcists seem to miss out that little nugget of information. Now although this demon is downright evil, he or she will grant you the knowledge of every language in the world. However, the bad news, he or she will only teach you the foulest and most offensive words, so say bye bye to your friends, I guess. Yeah, you'll be educated, but you will be vile beyond belief. So, you'll be me. In at 2, Renov. In demonology, Renov is described as a marquee and the great earl of hell, hence why he is number 2 on our list. This dude commands 20 legions of demons, making him one of the most notorious demons throughout history, one that you certainly don't want to be messing around with. Now, what makes him quite the enigma is that yes, he's awful, the worst, but he's also somewhat of a scholar. He teaches art, rhetoric languages, and gives loyal servants the favour of friends and foes. Now, you may be familiar with this demon, as he is the one who wrote How to Win friends and influence people, which is horrible enough, but what makes this demon truly terrible is that he is the taker of old souls. Basically this means anyone who is older, older looking, or looks a little under the weather, Renov will claim them. Also pets are not immune to this, he will kill them too. Your best option is just to steer clear of all your elderly relatives, and consider getting a new, younger looking pet. Just saying, they gotta go. And finally, coming in at number 1, Baphomet. This name may ring a bell for you, and that's because Baphomet is a deity that the Knights Templar were falsely accused of worshipping, following which time it was subsequently incorporated into occult and mystical traditions throughout history. It first appeared in trial transcripts for the Inquisition of the Knights Templar beginning in 1307, which resulted in it being popularised in the English language in the 19th century during debate and speculation on the reasons for the suppression of the Templars. The appearance of Baphomet is that of a goat, an image drawn by Eliphaz Levi, which contains binary elements representing the sum total of the universe. More interesting still, this picture of Baphomet is often used as a stand in for Satan, by Satanists and Christians alike. Now, it is a highly debated topic about whether this demon was truly good or bad, but if we look to historical accounts, Baphomet comes from a letter written by a French crusader in 1098. He describes the crusader's enemies in the Holy Land, I quote, calling upon Baphomet prior to battle. Baphomet refers to Muhammad, the prophet. European Christian doctor 
dogma viewed the worship of Muhammad as idolatry, which was harnessed by a medieval European ruler in the form of a witch hunt targeting his political opponents. Coming in at number 5 we have Abaddon. The Old Testament is kind of like the dark side of the Bible. It's filled with stories of death, destruction and more death. Abaddon, also known as the destroyer and angel of abyss, is one of the characters in the good book that is not so good. Remember in the book of Revelations when God destroys most of the earth and its inhabitants? Well Abaddon is a key player in the brutal event that left the world in shreds. According to the story, seven trumpets sounded to mark each step of the apocalypse. The first four attacked the earth, water and skies, killing a third of the planet's wildlife, vegetation, fresh water, oceans and light. This indirectly caused the death of many people, but it wasn't until Abaddon was unleashed that God struck humans directly. As the fifth trumpet sounded, a star fell from the sky, opening a bottomless pit in Earth's crust. Smoke funneled out of the dark abyss and out came a horde of mutant locusts, commanded by Abaddon to inflict intense pain to the people of Earth. Equipped with a scorpion tail, these little monstrosities set out to torture humans for five months, but not to kill them. That would have been too humane, I suppose. Coming in at number four, we have Legion. Perhaps the most haunting story in the New Testament is that of Legion. He lived among the dead deep within the tombs, appearing not much more alive than a corpse. At night, the townspeople would hear his screams and avoid the man said to be possessed by the unclean spirits, also known as demons. No longer could they control him, he kept breaking loose from the chains that bound him at his wrists and ankles. Night and day he wandered the wild while cutting his own flesh with sharp stones and shrieking in agony. One day while traveling along the lake to the region of the Jurassenes, Jesus gets out of his boat and is abrasively approached by the man of no name. Dropping to his knees before him, the man begs Jesus not to torture him, for the Lord had commanded the evil spirits to emerge. Jesus then asked, what is your name? To which the possessed man replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. Fearing that they would be cast away into the abyss, the many demons that possessed the man asked to be sent along the pigs in the nearby hillside. Jesus granted the demons permission and off they went to the thousands of pigs. Now possessed by the evil spirits, the herd plunged to their death and were drowned in the lake below. This man was finally free from the legion of demons. Coming in at number 3 is Barith or Baal Barith. In Christian demonology, this demon is considered the chief secretary of the underworld or great duke of hell. This high ranking official is often seen as the same as Beelzebub in some theories, but in this context they're not to be confused. His name apparently means God of the Covenant, so if any demons in hell need paperwork signed, Barith is the guy to get the job done. He's often depicted as a demonic soldier riding a red horse and sporting a golden crown upon his head. In other grimoires, his skin is also red. This demon is known for manipulating and tempting men to commit heinous acts, like blasphemy and murder. Bereth is also said to be one of the demons who possessed a nun in the famous Louvier's exorcism case. Coming in at number two, we have Adramelech, known as the Fire King. The name Adramelech only appears in the Old Testament twice, but his stories pack a mean punch, especially with children. The first time he's mentioned, he's regarded as the son of the Assyrian king. He ends up murdering his father in cold blood while in the temple worshipping his idol. The worst part is that this story is relatively tame compared to the next time we see the name Adramelech. In the Book of Kings, he's mentioned as being a sun god worshipped by the Sephirites, who were sacrificing in his honour by burning them alive, hence the Fire King nickname. Adramelech is often depicted with the torso of a man, the head of a mule, and the tail of a peacock. Okay, so that doesn't sound as scary as you're expecting a demon to be, but there's something unsettling about his looks. However, in other lore, he's considered Satan's stylist, so he must be doing something right. Another nickname he holds is Chancellor of Hell, which kind of reminds me of Supreme Chancellor Palpatine from Star Wars. Interestingly enough, both villains indirectly caused children to be killed. Adramelk with the children sacrificed in his honor and manipulated Anakin with the younglings, but I digress. In Robert Silverberg's short story Basilisk, he's described as guile and mischief than Satan. In the number one spot is none other than Beelzebub. If you've ever heard the song Bohemian Rhapsody, then you've heard the name Beelzebub. I won't sing it again for you, I sang it in a previous video. I won't do it again. He's considered one of the big wigs in the fiery pits of hell and is sometimes an alternative name for the devil himself in Christianity. Beelzebub is one of the most powerful demons. In the gospel, according to Mark, the Pharisees disparagingly accuse Jesus of exercising demons by the power of Beelzebub, and even refers to Beels as Prince of Devils. He's also considered one of the seven princes of hell by German bishop and theologian Peter Binsfeld. In 1589, Binsfeld paired each of the deadly sins with a demon, ranking them the highest. 
highest authority in hell. Beelzebub has the honor of representing gluttony. Lord of the Flies is another name for this terrifying demon given he's the leader of the Order of the Fly. He's often depicted as an actual fly or a grotesque creature with massive wings. It is said that Beelzebub was a prominent figure in the Salem witch trials, you know the mass witch hysteria towards the end of the 17th century that had more than 200 people accused of witchcraft and led to the slaying of 19 people. Yeah. Well Beelzebub was blamed for corrupting said people and turning them on a path to Satan. Coming in at number 5 we've got Astaroth. You feeling lazy lately? After a good year or so indoors, followed by some intense socialization, you probably feel like it's time to hibernate again. Fall is rapidly approaching, and with it the desire to drink hot tea and never leave the house. There are horror movies to be watched, and fall recipes to be cooked, but be careful! If you use all of this as an excuse, you might be under the influence of Astaroth. Riding around on the back of a dragon and carrying a staff that sort of looks like a snake, this dude is all about laziness. Astaroth's whole deal is tempting mortals into being lazy. Once he gets them there, it's so much easier to manipulate them into bad behavior. More souls for hell, more blood for the blood god, and all that good stuff. Sounds like fun, right? That's not all he does though, although that is a pretty rough task. People are naturally inclined to laziness anyway, so being tempted into that kind of thing is the worst. In addition to that though, he's also the treasurer of hell, and helps the new demons get a hang of things when they first show up, showing them the super hot ropes and whatnot. Interesting that Hell has a currency that they needed organized, eh? I'm sure he does plenty of laundering across all sorts of seedy underworld activities. Interestingly enough, witches see Astaroth a little differently. They consider him a female demon with expertise in all sorts of areas, more specifically, lust, protection, and love. So Astaroth can be many things, but one thing is for sure, and that is Astaroth's terrible breath. That's a fun little demonic detail. In Christian lore, it appears that Astaroth also has dominion over math, and can make people invisible in their search for treasure, so uh, Nathan Drake and Indiana Jones may have something to talk to this demon about. And like most demons of higher orders, Astaroth can answer any questions asked as long as they fall under the topics he knows about. Coming in at number 4, we've got Olivier. A real jerk, this one. We can see this playing out across all cultures and eras, and it's always justified by some ridiculous standard. Cruelty and hatred towards the poor and disenfranchised. More than ever, the line between stable and in the street is thin and blurry, and Olivier takes full advantage of this. I'm sure all sorts of entrepreneurs, influencers, and money hoarders have been visited by this demon. Olivier, baby! The so-called Prince of Archangels down in the depths, and patron demon of encouraging malice and viciousness towards the poor. That is indeed a low, low demon to be. We live in a messed up world already, why should the poor be reviled for simply being poor? At what point do we decide that work is the ultimate good and that nothing else can stand in for that morally or economically? It seems as though the folks who do the most important, most real work, say building the structures that we inhabit or bringing food to the masses, get the short end of the stick. And Olivier apparently has a fair share in keeping that the way things are. Middle managers and corporate drones keep their specific machines chugging and then dump on the poor, telling them that they should simply work harder. Forget Astaroth making folks lazy, making folks think that others are lazy for not making as much money as them is really wild. Olivier, you really are a rat, aren't you? Coming in at number 3, we've got our Dramalek. So we talked about Beelzebub last time and his tendency to bring about terrible things. There's plenty of responsibility that comes with being Lord of the Flies, and he's gotta have some help from time to time. Unfortunately, there aren't any temp agencies or internship programs in hell. Most folks are just destined to do their jobs and do them for all of time. This is where Adramalek comes in. This demon does his best to give Beelzebub a hand by assisting the Lord of the Flies as a great minister and chancellor, a lofty title for such an interesting demon. On top of being this assistant in Hell's hierarchy, Adramalek was also known for being a sun god who demanded human sacrifice. So even before being adopted by those beneath the surface, he was causing trouble. I wonder how many humans were dropped in his name. And I wonder how many of them ended up in Hell, possibly even under his command. Makes you think now, doesn't it? There might be a moon god brother out there demanding similar bloodshed, but I can't make any guarantees. Lastly, before I go, I'll bring up a point I mentioned in another video. Adramalek has quite the eye for fashion, and quite possibly a taste for Prada. You see, the devil relies upon this particular demon for all of his wardrobe needs. That's right, Adramalek is in charge of the clothes the devil wears. You'd think that down in hell it wouldn't matter all that much, but vanity is a sin, so that fits right in. Coming in number 2, we've got Vareen. Oh, this is a nasty one. Patience is a virtue indeed, and it is so easy to lose it. Plus, once patience is off the table, everything just gets 
so much worse. Sure, some can sit back, relax, and wait, but there are so many forces acting against you at all times. Who wants to wait, right? Especially in this era of constant and instant gratification. Why sit quietly and be ready for whatever when you can do a nosedive into your phone and drown in all of the readily available content? Hell, I bet a lot of you folks watching right now should be doing something else, or at least preparing to do something. Barine is the demon of impatience and loves to push humans towards acting impatiently. He does it without delay too, no waiting in line, no queuing up, no sitting about until something good happens. So all the folks in your life who seem to act impatiently are probably being influenced by this demon. The dude in the beat up Corolla who doesn't seem to know what a zipper merge is and decides to rush all the way to the end of the disappearing lane to just nose his way in. Barine. The lady at the supermarket who absolutely can't believe all of these selfish people with full carts in front of her line unbelievable despite her equally full cart. Marine. Those folks who pre-order every gosh darn pop culture artifact they think is cool and then whine until it finally arrives in the mail. Marine. Impatience will end us all, especially if we give into it. Most things will come with time, but if you try too hard to speed up the process, you're just asking for heightened blood pressure and a desire to lash out at all those around you. And that's no fun. Some actually describe Varine as a female demon too, so if you subscribe to that belief, ignore what I said before while referring to this entity as male. Interestingly enough, this impatient demon is mostly aligned with creation rather than destruction, which is a strange thing for a demon to do, but hey, I'm not going to claim to understand the whims and goals of each and every underworld entity. One last little tidbit before we move on to our final demon of the day, Varine was supposedly involved in a pretty large scale possession way back in the 17th century. Yep, it possessed a whole swath of nuns, which had plenty of implications for the church and those who followed it. Fun, right? And finally, at number one, we've got Louvart. Supposedly the only fallen angel amidst the demonic hierarchy, Louvart is often referred to as the Prince of Angels. High praise for someone so low. This demon is many things, but one that appears quite often is the idea that he presides over possessions. Louvart was even blamed for the possession of Sister Madeline during the demonic attacks in 17th century France. A round of applause for Louvart, everyone. Jolly good show. Most would think that they'd be safe seeking refuge within the holiest of holy books, but apparently there are plenty of demons. Number 5, Abessa Thibu. Coming up first on our list of angels who are anything but angelic is Abessa Thibu, who would frequently correct the other angels on how his name was pronounced. He's a fairly obscure angel, but an incredibly powerful one of lore. Abessa Thibu introduces himself as a hostile threat to God, and would end up becoming a demon dueling with Moses, and fancies himself a nemesis to the kingdom of heaven. That's a lofty ambition. Abessa Thibu lived in heaven alongside the other angels and God whom he served under. When Beelzebub left heaven, he took some buddies with him, and among them was our good friend Abe the Unpronounceable here. Beelzebub would explain to Solomon that during this fall, he took Abessa Thibu with him, who became a demon of the earth. In his newfound demon form, Abessa Thibu has one giant red wing, which took on a twisted mutated form after he fell. As he was falling from the heavens, the other angels were all like, oh no, not Abessa Thibu, we love Love that guy! And they tried to grab him to save him. But unfortunately, it failed and his wings were torn off. And the little stump wing that remained mutated and twisted into a swollen, monstrous dark red wing, which would probably be terrible. But if you're like an edgy fallen angel, that's probably just perfect for your aesthetic. You probably look so cool. This demon saw himself not just as an enemy of God, but also to Moses, determining to make Moses' life just terrible. In the Testament of Solomon, he claims he was the source of all turmoil that Moses had encountered, confessing that he hardened the Pharaoh's heart against Moses, leading to the Exodus. When Moses led the Israelites across parted waters, the demon followed. When the Red Sea closed on the Pharaoh's army, Abedha Hebu found himself trapped in a pillar of air trapping him inside, condemning him to support the pillar until the end of time. If you're looking for more scary stories about demons, angels, aliens, spaceships, monsters, cryptids, ghosts, goblins, and just about everything scary under the sun and above it, stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary and don't miss a minute. Number four, Samael. As far as bad angels go, Samael is probably beat out only by the angels from Neon Genesis Evangelion for destruction. He's sometimes called the Angel of Death, which is how you know he's kind of bad news, and his name literally translates to Venom of God. You don't get to wave titles like that around without being pretty lethal to back it all up. Kind of like Azrael, Samael is fiercely loyal to God without question. Whatever God wants Samael to do, he'll do it. Good, 
evil. None of those things mean anything to him. He doesn't make choices or render judgment. He kind of just follows orders. If God told him to eat a can of worms, he'd do it. On the hour of a man's death, it's said that Samael will make himself known to you. He'll appear before you with his blade drawn, soaked in poison. God's venom. This poison is what truly severs a man's soul from this mortal coil, withering and rotting them as you get a taste for it. It's thought that this is where the term to taste death comes from. Samael is also known as the accuser, the seducer, and a midnight joker. He accused the Israelites of idolatry and condemned them all to an early death when they fled with Moses. He seduces humans into acts of evil and well I know this is making him sound like he's a really evil guy and he's doing evil acts and sure he does rub elbows with equal number of angels and demons but he's just doing what he's paid to. Samael is God's will but he's also kind of like God's mercenary you know he just does whatever he's asked. And he tries to test humanity and draw out their sinful and unrepentant ways so God can judge them properly. And those who fail we'll get another visit from Samael. He's not such an evil guy, he just flicks the switch. He's got a little bit of a friendly, brotherly rivalry with the Archangel Michael. Michael's role as an angel is to protect humanity and Samael's is to vilify it. Michael defended the Israelites when Samael was accusing them and Michael replaced Isaac with a ram so that Abraham wouldn't sacrifice him. They both want the same thing, you know, they just want to make God happy, they just go about it in slightly different ways. Number three is going to be Abaddon, one of many angels who was tasked with doling out divine judgment to humanity. He was sent by God to torture the earth and humanity as punishment for all of their sins. Ugh. Interestingly, in some truly ancient Gnostic texts, Abaddon actually helped out pitching in creating humanity. Oh. Thanks man. It's said that he gathered handfuls of dirt from the earth for which God could craft Adam with. I did not know he was made out of dirt. Anyway, Abaddon helped start everything, so I guess it only seems fair and fitting that one day he's allowed to end everything. It's said during Judgment Day, Abaddon will gather the souls of the damned and carry them down to the place of God's final judgment. Jeez, with guys like these, what do we even need Satan for? His name, Abaddon, literally translates to the destroyer or the destruction, which is why he might actually be the real angel of Death. I'm so sorry Samael, I know you really wanted it, but Abaddon just worked like a little bit harder for it. There's a little bit of theological confusion when it comes to Abaddon as depending on the source text, occasionally he's not an angel at all but a subordinate of Satan, leading a pack of demons instead of anything divine. Even more interestingly than that though, is that sometimes he's not even a living being. Sometimes he's straight up a place. In some Jewish and Christian texts, he's listed as a hellish abyss thought to be another realm of the afterlife. For example, Job 31.12 refers to a fire that consumes to Abaddon. Some believe that Abaddon is both an entity and this bottomless pit afterlife realm that he can manifest himself as both. Or maybe Abaddon was just a really common name back then, you know? Maybe there was a ton of Abaddons running around. Number two, Azrael. Azrael is a lesser known angel in Christian and Judaistic texts. He's an archangel of heaven, like Gabriel or Samael, but he commands frightening power as he is the angel of destruction. He was commanded by God himself to eradicate and renew life. He's an angel, sure, but he's kind of one of the scarier angels out there. He carries out the will of God no matter what that may entail. If he has to collect the souls of the dead or melt sinners with punishment, Azrael is totally game for it. Unlike some of these other fake angels, Azrael is always is loyal to God above, no matter how heavy the task. You probably know that the cherubic depiction of angels that like greeting cards and cartoons use is a bit of a pop culture cleanup, and that biblically accurate angels are terrifying. I mean, there's a reason the first thing angels are always saying in biblical texts is, be not afraid. Maybe you've seen some of those biblically accurate angel memes, those are all gold. Well, Azrael is no different. There's no one definition of Azrael's form, but he doesn't always just look like a handsome human boy with wings. He usually is said to have four faces and a body covered in an infinite amount of fractally expanding eyes and tongues. And these eyes and tongues are supposed to represent the souls of man on earth. We all correlate. We all have an eye and a tongue on Azrael's big body somewhere. In Islamic texts, Azrael is said to have 70,000 feet and 4,000 wings and I, I guess just like two hands. Azrael across all texts is omnipotently powerful on a near cosmic scale. He's said to keep track of every single soul on earth and is responsible for all of them. In the Old Testament, King David can committed adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. And when he confesses his sins to God, God rules the king can choose what punishment shall befall him. Well, King David was a little shy, so he lets God pick anyway, and God chooses one of his old classics, Plague, and Azrael, 
happy to carry out the will of God, spreads a plague across Jerusalem, ending the lives of some 70,000 men. Well, if that's the case, at least he'll be losing some of those ever expanding eyes and mouths, right? Probably fill up some space on the canvas. That's not so bad. And finally, number one, Michael. In a modern context, I think there's something funny about putting the, the ultimate, scariest, most powerful angel out there is a being named Michael. Just knowing that God's most fearsome, loyal warrior could potentially go by Mikey kind of takes something away from him. Now, while most of the angels on this list kind of have like a dubious, morally gray reputation and sometimes get themselves involved on some very nasty business on God's behalf, Michael is the hero archangel. Michael is commonly depicted as a radiant, shining, soldier wearing gold armor. He's beautiful, handsome, brave, and he carries with him a powerful sword and shield for which he can carry out God's will and protect man with. When you close your eyes and you kind of think of like a divine warrior, you're picturing Michael without you even knowing it. Michael is a legendary warrior in heaven's army, and he goes toe to toe with Satan in combat. For the control of Moses' his soul, most famously, Satan declared that Moses' his soul was his for the taking, and since Moses had taken life before the exodus, Satan thought he had a claim on this, but Moses was a servant of the Lord, so this wasn't going to work out. Michael flew down from up above to lay a celestial beatdown on the Prince of Darkness. Michael is almost like an angelic superhero, a, a light in the darkness, someone who swoops in to defend humanity from the legions of the world and the corruption of the damned. He's kind of like a total boy scout. He's also not just any old archangel, he's THE archangel. The Greek etymology for archangel means chief angel, implying that Mikey here isn't just a really good angel, but like the captain of the angels, implying that there are no true peers on his level of devotion. During Judgment Day, when it's said a war of angels and demons will be carried out, Michael will be the commander leading the armies of heaven on the ground against the forces of evil. In the old scriptures, Michael only says one thing, and it's kind of like an action movie one-liner while he's fighting Satan. With sword drawn, Michael boasts, the Lord rebuke you. Simple, to the point, very cool. Coming in at number 5 we have Phoenix. Most people see the Phoenix as nothing more than a myth, but there have been potential sightings throughout the years that led many to believe the bird is real. Those who believe this think the bird is almost extinct due to being hunted thousands of years ago, and those left live in fear and are hiding. The Phoenix is an immortal creature. Once it comes to the end of one life cycle, it will simply be born again from its own ashes. Some say it burns to ashes at the end of its life, others claim it's simply passes and decomposes before being born again. The first time that the phoenix was recorded in history was in the 19th century. Since then, many more have told what they believe to know about the creature. Some believe that the phoenix was a key to everlasting life or a gateway in heavenly paradise. It is now believed that this may have led to humanity attempting to contain and keep the powers for themselves, leading to the near extinction of the species. Since this, little has been known about them and few sightings of what might be the remaining few birds. In the first text written about the creature, the author made an observation. The phoenix outlives nine ravens. Once people started to notice the nature of their lives, the people were unstoppable in their pursuit. There was also evidence supporting the idea that the Egyptians prayed to the sacred bird. They understood the rarity of the creature and saw it as a blessing to worship. Today the phoenix is often seen in books and movies. There have also been studies carried out attempting to study the existence of the animal. People will often refer to things rising from the ashes in triumph in a way a phoenix would. It is a celebrated creature while also wildly being seen as mythical. Who knows, one day we may know even more about them. Coming in at number 4, Salamander. Salamanders are of course real, they are a group of amphibians typically characterized by their lizard-like appearance, but it is believed they were once more than just your average lizard. Time seems to have taken something from these creatures. It is believed in folklore that the creature once had an affinity with fire. It has the ability to control and create the elemental fire. They are able to sustain fire, being able to walk through or stand in it untouched by the flames. Some have claimed that during the tragedy of Pompeii, the fire salamander was the only thing that remained of the city, the only thing not destroyed by the lava. They are able to put out fire as well as starting them. Apparently they dwell in locations with high temperatures, for example within volcanoes. There are stories that come from legends of salamanders being created when glass blowers left their furnace burning for many days and nights. The lizards nearby were transformed by the flame and it became a part of them. There is a lot of evidence and claims that the salamander existed, but it is unknown if they still exist. Some people think that over time these creatures were adapted to a different climate and location and lost their ability 
ability to withstand, extinguish and control fire. Leonardo da Vinci was in particular obsessed with the creatures. He did experiments and wrote what he could about the peculiar creature. He wrote about witnessing the skin of the lizard constantly renew in the fire. He said the creature had no digestive organs and it feeds off of the heat of the flame. Some believe that the fire salamander was the last remnant from dragons. Like every other ancient creature, it either adapted to the new world or became extinct. Coming in at number 3 we have Fire Serpent. The Fire Serpent is said to be an evil entity. It chooses to represent itself as an anthropomorphic snake. It is said that the entity can travel across the sky resembling a shooting star or a fiery rocket. It will look like a blue ball of flame shooting across the sky. It is said that this creature and evil entity reveals itself at night. It is said that the giant serpent can choose any form to appear to you in, whatever it needs to appear as for you to wander into its path. As the creature is a serpent it cannot speak or hear. It only hopes appearing as the person you love the most in the world you will go to it without needing any words of confirmation. It is said once you are visited by the serpent you will not remember the encounter but you will experience weight loss and exhibit signs of insanity. Many people claim to have seen the serpent but its terrifying existence is still something that many doubt. Those who have been driven insane by the experience are not believed about the encounter or they simply disappear without a trace or anyone to witness the encounter. Many think that this creature is responsible for many shooting stars. It's unknown if there's just one entity or if there are multiple but the sightings have been few and far between, suggesting it works alone. There are some Aztec statues that depict the fire serpent. This has led people to believe the creature has been on earth far longer than we have. It seems unable to find its way back home and has had to adapt to our lives here, keeping a distance where possible. Historians believe the creature was a weapon of the sun and they both worshipped and feared the creature. Coming in at number 2, Sharuf. The Sharuf is a humanoid creature made of rock, crystals and magma. It is said that they live deep underground in magma pools. These are mostly found deep within Chilean volcanoes. For many years the Chilean people have blamed the creatures for causing earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. It is because of these creatures that in ancient times human sacrifices were made to volcanoes. They believe this was the only way to satiate the beast taste for human flesh. They believe once the creature had been fed the sacrifice the volcano would no longer erupt or at least not until he got hungry once again. Some believe that the creature was originally created when someone fell deep into the volcano. Once they fell something happened when the lava did not tear through their body but instead formed a hard layer outside of their skin. As they laid there the rock layer around the skin got thicker and thicker until it was part of them. Since then they were the humanoid creature. It lost all humanity. It grew a hunger for flesh and demanded a human sacrifice. They grew angry and punished the humans if they did not show a willingness to sacrifice in the way they once did. It is said once transformed it can outlive its human counterparts if it gets who it was and dwells in the volcanic rock for thousands of years. The human ritual of human sacrifice ended sometime in the 1960s. Each time there was a disaster they would make a sacrifice. They did this in hopes it would stop the earthquake, extreme weather or anything else. This was finally stopped in the 60s when it was recognized as barbaric. It is unknown if the creatures still dwell causing natural disasters. Maybe the lack of sacrifice has starved them of what they needed to survive. If the theory of the creature was correct this was stopped or slowed down the occurrence of natural disaster. So it seems it still dwells beneath the surface. And finally in at number 1 we have dragons. It would not be a list about fire creatures if it didn't include dragons. Belief about dragons vary from place to place. They are often portrayed as winged, horned, four legged and capable of flight. I'm sure most of you have seen or heard of a dragon before. They are one of the most popular mythical creatures to ever exist. It is believed that the teachings about dragons comes from East Asian culture. They tell stories of their deities having dragons as their personal mounts or companions. They are seen as strong creatures. They are good natured and work with humans not against them. The question is are dragons 100% mythical or are they legend born from an old truth? I'm sure there are many people who refuse to believe in dinosaurs so it could be possible that the dragons were something that roamed the earth during or before the Triassic period. As we know many dinosaurs were capable of flight and somewhat resemble a dragon so it's not the most unbelievable theory in the world. There may even be evidence to support this theory. On April 1st 1998 an article was published that revealed a discovery. 
they had uncovered a near complete skeleton of a dragon like dinosaur. They named their findings Smorg. The discovery was suspended in a jar and shocked everyone who saw it. The dragon like creature is small enough to sit on your finger. Many believe this to be a hoax and dismissed it, but there is no doubting this little dinosaur looks like a dragon that was preserved by the earth for possibly millions of years. What do you think? Do you believe that dragons could be real or just something that exists in the stories like Harry Potter or Game of Thrones? Coming in at number 5, Mammon. Mammon, also known as Maimon or Plutus, is a powerful fallen angel. Mammon, now a demon, is commonly personified as greed itself. He is the noble demon lord of abundance, prosperity, wealth and injustice. He also is most often personified as a deity. In his appearance, Mammon is somewhat similar to the gods Plutus and Dispater, especially when Plutus appears in the Divine Comedy as a wolf-like demon of wealth, wolves being associated with greed in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas metaphorically described the sin of greed as Mammon being carried up from hell by a wolf, coming to inflame the human heart with greed. During his time in heaven, he was depicted as forever looking downward at heaven's golden pavement rather than God himself. In fact, Mammon's obsession with gold was to the point where he did not even care about Lucifer's rebellion, but due to the fact that he cared more about material wealth than God, he was cast out by the archangel Gabriel. After the rebellion in heaven, Mammon was banished to hell where he is the one who finds underground precious metal that his demonic companions used to build their capital city, Pandemonium. He did this by Lucifer's order. Mammon cancels the devils to be happy with what they have got and to create a home for themselves in hell. At some point in time, with the aid of Mulsabert, Mammon created the legendary Twin Blade, which was made from the bones of a fallen angel, salt that was crystallized from the tears of Michael, then melted down with the ichor of a god into Damascus steel. The Twin Blade is capable of killing almost anything. In at number 4 we have Asmodeus. Asmodeus is a king of demons and earthly spirits, mostly known from the Book of Tobit. The demon is also mentioned in some Talmudic legends, for instance in the story of the construction of the Temple of Solomon. He was thought to be the king of the Nine Hells by some Renaissance Christians. He also represents one of the seven deadly sins, lust. Being the demon of lust, he is responsible for twisting people's sexual desires. It is said that people who fall to Asmodeus's ways will be sentenced to an eternity in the second level of hell. He is also a demon of literary jealousy, anger and revenge. Asmodeus is either a ruthless, brutal monster, a mischievous demon endowed with a playful and satirical genius. Asmodeus was originally an angel known as Asmodal and was in the order of Cherubim. Right before the war in heaven, he joined Lucifer's rebellion against the Lord only to be personally defeated by the archangel Raphael. But not before Raphael brutally tore out the lion part of his body and cast him out of heaven with the rebel angels in tow. Asmodeus barely survived the fall due to the injuries inflicted on him by Raphael, but he managed to recover. The lion that was originally part of him, now torn, became something of a pet and steed. He also became one of the seven kings of hell, embodying the sin of lust. He has hundreds of legions of demons under his command. He incites gambling and is the overseer of all the gambling houses in the court of hell. Asmodeus also became the husband of Lilith, though she does not exactly find his presence to be welcoming or tolerable at all. In at number 3 we have Belphegor. Belphegor is a fallen angel, now a demon lord that presides over the sin of sloth and is one of the seven princes of hell that rules hell. Belphegor gives people ideas for inventions that will make them rich, which leads them to be greedy and selfish. Belphegor is a lieutenant from hell who had been dispatched to earth on a mission by Satan. As one of the fallen angels, Belphegor was originally a member of the Order of Principalities, and after his fall he became a demonic counterpart to one of the ten Sephiroth that oversees the Tree of Life. During his time in heaven, Belphegor was a friend of his model and Mammon, but he did not exactly enjoy his angelic duties, foreshadowing his slothful tendencies. Moreover, Belphegor enjoyed crafting strange and intricate objects from all manner of material he could find, which according to him was his outside hobby. Unlike the majority of rebel angels, Belphegor did not join Lucifer's side after he declared the war against heaven, nor was he at God's side either. Despite not being part of Lucifer's rebellion, the fact that he did not join God's side earned him his father's punishment of being cast down to hell alongside other rebel angels. No longer an angel of God, but an archdemon of sloth. Belphegor, along with Asmodeus and Mammon, was soon awakened by the sound of Lucifer's voice calling out to him from newly created hell as a result of his impact from the fall. Belphegor took part in the construction of Pandemonium, given his talent and interest in machinery. He participated by crafting the inner workings of the capital, whilst Mulsiba and Mammon worked on both the exterior and interior. He was then present at the Pandemonium during Lucifer's rally. Belphegor had then become one of the seven kings of hell. Belphegor is invoked by mortals who wish to find fame and wealth through invention, often with as little effort as possible. These wishes, as with almost any demonic invocation, are doomed to fail because Belphegor's true mission is to draw the lazy into the sin of sloth. Through the failure of whatever Belphegor provided to the invocation, 
invoker, he draws them into procrastination and idle dreaming rather than producing, thus damning them. So maybe you're not lazy, you're just damned by Belphegor. Coming in at number 2 we have Malok. Malok was once an angel serving God. Due to his own self interest he was cast out. He gained a cult following and many worshipped and followed him in ancient times. Child sacrifice is non existent today, hopefully, but that hasn't always been the case. In ancient times it was commonly associated with people hoping for greater fertility, free the person or a land. One cult stands out from the rest, the cult of Malok, the Canaanite god of child sacrifice. In the bowels of a big bronze statue with the body of a man and the head of a bull, offerings at least according to the Hebrew Bible were to be reaped through either fire or war. It is said that devotees can still be found today. People prayed and offered to Malok as they believed he was responsible for the weather and fertile agriculture. If they wanted their land and people to thrive, they believed that they must make this sacrifice for the gods or specifically Malok to bless them. Though the biblical account describes children being passed through the fire to Malok, Hebrew prophets are universal in their condemnation of the practice. This has suggested that such sacrifices might have been made to the Abrahamic god by some cult, but were condemned and cast out of the orthodox faith as anthema. Followers argued that this was not a practice of God but those who were led astray. Others claim that Malak was an angel before he fell and those who followed him mistook his word for religion. There are religious sacrifices sites still standing around the world today, preserved in time as a reminder of the dark history of following false gods. Although it was more commonplace in ancient culture, there are modern cases of Malak worship. Obviously these are kept more personal, as this would not be accepted. There have been claims that some influential people in today's society secretly make sacrifices to Malak to gain power and influence over today's world. Of course, we do not have evidence of this, just claims. Do you believe that people are committing such horrible acts for their own self interest? And finally, in at number one, we have Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan, the devil, light bringer, the light bearer, and the morning star, was one of the earliest of God's creations. Also, the twin brother of Michael. He was regarded as the wisest, greatest, and most beautiful angel in all of creation, having virtually no equal, with only God being his superior. He is infamously known as the angel that rebelled against God and heaven and caused the downfall of mankind. Lucifer was said to be the brightest in all of creation and was the most revered too and most praised among the angels for his beauty and power. This in the process caused Lucifer to be prideful of himself. So immense was his grace and power that his throne was positioned atop a mountain anointed by God himself. Adorned with burning stones known only as the stones of fire, infused with the fires of the sun to give light to the dead and the lost as Lucifer guided them to paradise. It was not until God created humans that Lucifer's pride began to overtake him and grew more rebellious against his father. It soon led to Lucifer becoming dissatisfied with following God alongside the fact that his father favoured the new creations known as humans, spending less time with his own family and more on developing those humans. To add insult to injury, Lucifer would be told by God to watch over and guide these humans, which only made Lucifer look down on these mortals with contempt, especially when having a perfect being like him watching over these creatures like a shepherd over his flock. However, he saw that the humans would be no different than everything else that would be under God's puppet strings and realised that he could perhaps impart his ideas of existentialism on these new creations. He approached one of the two, named Lilith, who was strolling through the primeval plains of the Garden of Eden, and the two had a rather amicable conversation. During the conversation, Lucifer managed to persuade Lilith into siding with him as well. He convinced her that since Lilith had been created from clay, the same as Adam, she is equal to him, and therefore should not be under him. She would be no puppet bound to any string, and would instead live out her life the way she desires to live it rather than having been told how and why. Lilith was enlightened by the Morning Star's words and this caused her not to be submissive to Adam and leave him. Being the second born creation of God, Lucifer is a being of incalculable celestial power. He is among the most powerful entities in all of creation. The only two beings that somewhat rival him in the depths of hell are Satan and Beelzebub. After being released onto earth, Lucifer's mere presence upon breaking through was said to have shook the globe and created several unnatural disasters around certain parts of the world. Moreover, his presence also caused supernatural beings and psychics immense agony and trembled from sheer dread. I don't think you need to tell me that Lucifer should definitely be feared and deserves a top place on this list. Number 5. Nephilim This one I can get behind for sure. How the pyramids were built still baffles me, and reading all about these things at least makes my brain relax for a second. The Giants the talls, the long neck people, the Nephilim. Again, never been a Bible guy myself, so no judgment if you say all this happened, but I'm just catching up on all this stuff. But in short, the Nephilim were like the offspring of angels and human women, according to Genesis 6, 1, 4, and Jude. The Nephilim are also mentioned in Numbers 13, 33, but it is likely that by this time in Israel's history, Nephilim was used as a term for a tall, intimidating peoples. It's plausible that the Nephilim were both half angels and half giants, 
elements, making them absolutely huge and absolutely super strong. The Nephilim were the children of the sons of gods and daughters of men. And Christian scholars have theorized that the sons of gods were actually these demonic fallen angels who reproduced with women. Being the offspring of partial angelic heredity, the Nephilim were considered mighty men who are of old the men of renown. The ancients. These people were huge, claiming that they were like five times the size of an average man. In the Hebrew Bible, a group of mysterious beings or people of unusually large size and length who lived both before and after the flood were called Nephilimus, sometimes translated to giants. Even the fallen ones from the Hebrew nephil, meaning to fall. Seems like these people were writing about similar stuff, huh? Spooky. Number four, 200 million horsemen. This next one is not really a creature as much as it's the end of a lot of all of us. All this Armageddon stuff they were saying, that's some pretty strange stuff that's on its way. Book of Revelation stuff, you know? Quote, I saw as God wanted to show me the horses and the men on them. The men had pieces of iron on their chests. These were red like fire and blue like the sky and yellow like sulfur. The heads of the horses looked like the heads of lions. Fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. One third part of all man was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur that came out of their mouths. Word for word. Horsemen or ancient biblical technology? This sounds horrifying. Also, 200 million? That's a lot of flying flaming horses just trucking around the skies and sands like giant tanks firing fire out of their mouths and nose. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal. And from the midst of all this came likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness. Hmm. Okay. You put a Baja hoodie on me at a Dave Matthews concert and hear me saying all that stuff, you probably just think I'm some sci-fi stoner. Nope. This is riveting material, folks. I need to read this thing front to back. Apparently, this force was supposed to have taken out or is going to take out a third of the entire world's population. I know like three things that can do that. Pandemics, missiles, and floods. However, if men and horses showed up with lion heads breathing fire, it's safe to say it's game over. Number three, the Leviathan. Okay, at first I was like, oh, that's a roller coaster at Canada's Wonderland. No, 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 this vicious monster was actually modeled after this vicious monster. The Leviathan, the second of the great monsters described in the book of Job. This Leviathan, Leviathan, is an absolute massive sea monster who's impervious to human weapons, breathes fire, and emits smoke from his nostrils. Uh, yeah, so this is a Zelda boss for sure. The Leviathan is probably related to another ancient monster called Lotan, a seven-headed giant serpent who represents primeval chaos, as with pretty much every other biblical creature does. Hey, these things aren't meant to be cute and fuzzy. There's some less exciting theories that insist the Leviathan is just a dramatic interpretation of a crocodile or anaconda or maybe a plesiosaur resembling something like the Loch Ness Monster. But that doesn't explain the breathing fire thing or the size. Was this giant sea snake a water dragon? Because apparently it's like 300 miles long. Yeah, terrifying. Scary thing now is many different religions and cultures have their own version of the Leviathan. Tiamat, Hydra, Jormungandr. Maybe this thing was just hunted into extinction. I don't know. What do you think? Number two, Archangel Michael. It is said that the angels are not humans, but creatures made from God's creation. I've also seen what the Bible describes angels looking like, and it's not handsome people with wings. Apparently a lot of these things, people really couldn't even describe what they were seeing in front of them. But we'll get to what these things look like in a minute. Of those creatures, Satan, AKA Lucifer, is one, the one. However, here is even one creature that Satan fears more than any creature, and that's fellow Archangel Michael or Saint Michael. Some say they're brothers, some say they were on the same team for a bit. This is some good stuff, people. Quote, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelation 12, 7, 9. Okay, so hold on. He and them are all down here with us? That's terrifying. Apparently Michael led that army, that one, so whatever scares Satan, scares the hell out of me as well. Also, all these pictures and statues of him and like window panes are all of him like wielding a giant sword made of light, just stepping on Satan's back as a hero. That's pretty intimidating, not gonna lie. And coming in at the number one spot, Ophanim. 
Okay, so what angels actually looked like apparently was like giant geometrical feathers with eyes and a consciousness. Some had horns, some had hooves, lots of gold and metal colors. This next thing doesn't even make sense to my brain. I feel like this is an ant hill trying to understand an iPhone. Quote, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the ground beside each creature with its four faces. This was the appearance and structure of the wheels. They sparked like topaz and all four looked alike. Each appeared to be made like a wheel, intersecting a wheel. As they moved, they would go in any one of the four directions the creatures were faced. The wheels did not change direction as the creatures went. Their rims were high and awesome, and all four rims were full of eyes all around. Ezekiel 1, 15, 18. Uh, first off, is this thing even a creature? Yeah, everything I see here is an alien. Is this just us trying to process some sort of like energy being with eyes? Because if I saw Lucifer that looks like the hunk on the Netflix show, and then I saw this thing? One of the Dead Sea Scrolls interprets them as angels. Late sections of the Book of Enoch interprets them as class of celestial beings who don't sleep and guard the throne of God. Whatever these thing or things are, it sounds and looks absolutely horrifying. How could you paint that on a ceiling? I would just give up and paint wings in a halo as well. For real though, like that is a spaceship of some sort, isn't it? I mean, I understand the times, maybe the science wasn't there, but this thing is straight out of a sci-fi novel. Number five, the behemoth. You wanted five more creatures and I wanted an excuse to keep reading this thing. This book is terrifying. Speaking of, did you know that there's a herbivore creature plated in spikes and armor with a tail the size of an oak tree? Head like a lion swallowing up rivers just roaming around back then? Yeah, apparently. The behemoth. This goliath of a beast was one of the first talked about. Not the first beast, that's a completely different thing. Also terrifying. The behemoth. God's secret weapon, and apparently the first thing he created. Hadn't made us in his image yet, so uh, this hippo tank Elder Scrolls boss was what God went with. One of the most popular and revered creatures in the Bible, quote, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee. He eateth grass like an ox. He moveth his tail like a cedar. His bones are as strong as pieces of brass. His bones are like bars of iron. Yeah, this is definitely a dinosaur, right? Right? Scholars seem to think that the behemoth is an aggressive exaggeration of a large hippopotamus or rhinoceros. Opening up its mouth and swallowing a river could literally mean it's just an animal thirsty. In 2003, French scientists working in Pakistan claimed to have discovered an extinct species of rhinoceros called a Baluk ethereum, which was much larger, much scarier, and matched the physical description given in the book of Job. Yeah, that's terrifying stuff. Number four, cherubim. These cute flying baby angels we see on soap ads and bottles are a lot scarier and much more sinister than the blonde cupids we're used to seeing. The cherubs, or cherubim, are God's throne bearers and appear over 90 times in the Bible. The Hebrew text says cherubim is a celestial winged being who represents God's spirit on earth and symbolizes the worship of God. In Ezekiel, cherubim are described as angelic creatures with two sets of wings and four faces. Faces. Lion, ox, human, and eagle. Okay, this is getting scarier and scarier. The four faces of the cherubim apparently represent the four domains of God's rule. The lion represents wild animals, man represents humanity, ox represents domestic animals, and the eagle represents birds. Aren't those all wild animals? I don't know. The cherubim appear in several texts of the Bible, including Genesis, Ezekiel, Kings, and Revelation. Yeah, so lots of people were seeing these things, and they all kind of sound somewhat the same. They all oddly say four faces, like every which way they turned, they could see a face. Some say, quote, they move quickly using a wheel within a wheel, and their wings cover their body. Question, what's with all the wheels? People just like looking up into the sky all day must have had like severe floaters in their eyes because a wheel and a cute baby angel thing look completely different, no? A conjoined wingspan of the four cherubim are described as forming a divine chariot, the so-called mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. Two cherubim make the Ark and form a space through which Yahweh would appear in Ezekiel's visions. The status of the cherubim are a sort of vehicle for Yahweh in the book of Samuel. So in a sense, they're kind of God's messengers, you know, bringing things up and down from him and to him, including him. Gotcha, a vehicle. Yeah, a vehicle. These images are terrifying. Yeah, and that's a mothership right there. That's a mothership, okay? Number three, unicorns. Hold up, this is scarier than the devil, right? Unicorns, really? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, not the glittery ones with Farrah Fawcett hair like Hercules rides. More like a firstborn bull. Giant with a huge spear on its head. He has majesty, and his horns are the horns of a wild ox, and with them he shall gore the peoples, all of them, to the ends of the earth. 
Okay, yeah, that's really aggressive. I guess unicorns were a little bit scarier in the Bible, huh? Couple times these things are brought up too. It seems like a lot of people were seeing these. Yeah, I'd say a hunk in a suit on a television series is much less scary than a monster horse goring you to death. A ram is mentioned nine times in the Hebrew Bible. It's been translated to unicorn in the King James Version, and some translations as oryx, which was seen as a wild ox or rhinoceros. Quote, And the unicorn shall come down with them, and the bullocks with the bulls, and their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust made fat with fatness. Uh, yeah. Harsh. I mean, rhinos and other single-horned animals do do this. The Bible describes unicorns skipping like calves, traveling like bulls, and bleeding when they die. So they were real and very mortal, mostly believed to be an exaggeration though. Even Julius Caesar speaks of them. Quote, a little below the elephant in size and appearance, color, and shape of a bull, their strength and speed are extraordinary. They spare neither man nor wild beast. Were the ancients seeing like giant extinct rhinos, or were these flying evil narwhals just goring everyone to the end of the earth? Who knows? Sure sounds like it. Number two, locusts. Dude, I'm already afraid of the 12 inch flying praying mantises that do exist today. I can't imagine what these things looked like. Imagine a dog sized flying insect blocking out the sun because there's so many of them. Abaddon's locusts. These things were terrifying. The Bible has this to say about them. The fifth angel, apparently Abaddon, sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and sky were darkened by smoke from the abyss, and out of the smoke, locusts came down upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions. These demon bugs are well detailed in the Bible. They're described as, quote, horse-like creatures preparing for battle, adorned with crowns of gold above their head. Their face is like a man, but woman's hair with lion's teeth. Their body was locust-like, covered with iron breastplates. They have scorpion-like stings on their tails and razor-sharp claws, and the sound of their army will be like a million horses marching to the battlefield. Dude, that's a locust? Like a locust, the bug? No, 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 I don't think so. They will be freed by their master Abaddon from the bottomless pit and will torment all of the remaining sinners on earth for five months. Abaddon is described as the king of the army of locusts. Yeah, guy's really into bugs. Yeah, that's like some fear factor stuff right there. Just like a million bugs swarming you? No, no thanks. And coming in at number one, the dragon. Okay, there's some speculation here that this thing is the devil himself. The devil and the dragon. But also this thing apparently lives with the devil. I don't know, people were saying mixed things, but important thing is things weren't too literal back then and they were really spiritual. People were just trying to explain what they were seeing and feeling the best way they could. But yes, there was dragons. Yeah, we have the skeleton bones. Okay? And before you're picturing something fun like Dudley the dragon or the ones that talk in The Hobbit who sit atop gold, no, no, no. Picture when it sneezes, it flashes light. Its eyes are like the red of dawn. Lightning leaps from its mouth. Flames of fire flash out. Smoke streams from its nostrils like steam from a pot heated over burning rushes. Its breath would kindle coals for flames shoot from its mouth. Yeah, this thing. Terrifying. Tremendous strength of Leviathan's neck strikes terror wherever it goes. Its flesh is hard and firm and cannot be penetrated. Job 41, 18, 23. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world was thrown down to the earth with all the angels. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from its mouth of the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. He seized the dragon, that old serpent who is the devil, Satan, and bound him in chains for thousands years. The angel threw him into the bottomless pit, which he then shut and locked so Satan could not deceive the nations anymore until a thousand years were finished. Okay, yeah, that sounds like one giant amazing cutscene from a God of War game. Just chucking a dragon into a pit? Also, it's 2022. We better lock that thing back up. It's been more than a thousand years now, no? Quote, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Okay, so it wears seven crowns. Maybe this thing is the devil. It's mentioned numerous times in the Bible. I've seen Game of Thrones. This thing is scary. 
Yeah. Coming in at number five, we have Angels of Paradiso. Hailing from the Bayonetta game series, the Angels of Paradiso are angels who appear marble-like with gold and ivory armor, and golden halos made of light. The angels that are often seen by humanity appear humanoid, closely resembling modern depictions of angels. However, others are more exotic. Higher ranks appear as ships or even cars, and other angels appear as angelic beasts. Most angels are able to influence the human world, with some of them even breaking free of physical bonds completely, allowing them to manipulate their physical form at will, and mimic Bayonetta's weapons and even her attacks, creating some truly powerful opponents. The Angels of Paradiso are the main antagonists of the series, and they will stop at nothing to ensure their victory against the human population in the process. You may think it odd that Bayonetta wants to fight angels, but at the end of the day, these angels wish to destroy her. They care very little for humanity, and only wish to see themselves succeed. These are the nastiest kind of angels, ones which don't follow the typical ideals of angels we're used to seeing depicted throughout history. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, it really helps us out a lot, and the YouTube algorithm pushes our content out there more, pushes me out there more. And if you like me, and you like top five, support us. Coming in at number four, we have Belial, also known as the King of Evil. Belial is the 68th spirit of the Goetia, and one of the four princes of hell ruling over the north. Belial is said to be a mighty and powerful king, being created right after Lucifer, and existing in his order. Looks-wise, he is a beautiful angel, often depicted sitting in a chariot of fire. However, he was one that angels against God and heaven, and was ultimately cast out, and now resides in the depths of hell, eventually going on to be part of the Stygian Council and becoming a king of hell. Belial governs 80 legions of spirits, and whoever summons this fallen angel must have offerings of gifts and sacrifices, or he will not meet their demands. He is the demons of lies and guilt, and is capable of inducing any type of sins, especially those related to sex and lust. His name can be translated to the Lord of Arrogance, or the Lord of Pride, and is often associated with immoral, atheists and magicians, and known for going against the grain. Now, despite not being as powerful or as terrifying as Lucifer, Blyle is a foreboding demon who fell from heaven, and you're gonna be glad he isn't real, that's for sure. Come in at number three, we have Lucifer. Now it comes as no surprise that Lucifer has a place on our list, and he is perhaps the most famous fallen angel who now resides in the depths of hell. Also known in some texts as Satan, the devil, light bringer, or even light bearer, Lucifer was one of the earliest of God's creations and the younger brother of Michael. He was often regarded as wise, great, and one of the most beautiful of the creations. However, when he rebelled against God and heaven, he was cast out and down to the depths of hell after causing the downfall of mankind. Now Lucifer was said to be opposed to predestination, a concept that describes destiny of all beings being under God's will and command. He began to view God as a tyrannical leader and declared that all people should be allowed to be in control of their own lives and their own destinies. Honestly, preach. <laughs> when he was banished out of heaven, it was said that Lucifer fell for days. I quote, nine times the space that measures day and night. It is said that when he finally stopped falling, his collision turned the lake of fire into the very constructs of hell. His appearance changed drastically with his wings being burned off and mutating into red bat-like wings. Now, Lucifer is as evil as they come. There's a reason his name and Satan's are often interchangeable. He is said to be a celestial power commanding the legions of hell, including its lords. When provoked to use his fire as a weapon and to quote Lucifer himself, better to reign in hell than serve in heaven. I'll see you there, Lucifer. I'll be in hell too. Coming in at number two, we have the cherubim. A cherub doesn't sound all that terrible. They are often depicted throughout history as relatively cute and often seen flying around with a bow and arrow. However, these angels aren't as sweet as you might think. A cherub is one of the unearthly beings who directly attend to God, according to Abrahamic religions. In the book of Ezekiel, the cherub is depicted as having two pairs of wings and four faces. That of a lion, an ox, a human, and an eagle. Very creepy indeed. The appearance of these creatures often being described as burning coals of fire. Definitely not how most people are used to seeing them, which is often depicted in works of art as giant babies flying around with smiles on their faces. The description of each cherub in the book of Ezekiel gets even more bizarre, with them being accompanied by half-machine, half-creature concoctions called wheels. They are enormous in size and covered in eyes, with them looking like a villain straight out of Hellboy. Now, cherubim are starting to sound quite terrifying, right? It makes a whole lot of sense why artists decided to paint cherubim more like Cupid than paint them how they actually are, which are straight-up monsters that look more like demons than angels. And finally coming in at number one, we have Weeping Angels. Hailing from the Doctor Who universe, the Weeping Angels are a race of predatory creature, first introduced in the 2007 episode Blink, although I think they may have been introduced earlier, I'm not sure. I know this much because it's the only episode of Doctor Who I've ever watched and it stars the utterly charming Carrie Mulligan. She's all that could draw me in. Now the Weeping Angels are quantum-locked humanoids that are capable of moving vast distances in just the blink of an eye. Now they 
don't outright kill their victims, but they do have the ability to feed on their energy of their unlived days. Despite nobody quite knowing where these weeping angels come from, the doctor describes them as, I quote, the deadliest, most powerful, most malevolent life form evolution has ever produced. How terrifying is that? With just a single touch, a weeping angel can send a person into their past and all the way back to their birth. With the doctor also stating that they are perhaps the only psychopaths in the universe to kill you nicely, <laughs> simply because their victims go uninjured and may live out long lives in the past. It is said that weeping angels have the power to turn ordinary statues into angels, with this being shown when the Statue of Liberty becomes one. It is also said that the kiss of a weeping angel has numerous effects, including transforming the kissed person into a duplicate of other people. Their kiss also has the ability to drain a person of their life energy, ultimately reducing them to dust. These sinister creatures are almost impossible to avoid, however victims have succeeded in the past by winking rather than forcing their eyes open and not blinking. This is how the 10th Doctor, David Tennant, avoided them during World War One.